You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. On the podcast, we have started a new series on the podcast looking at associate nations within cricket and how they are developing the game in their country. Many of us cricket fans know so much about the established cricketing countries and not enough on the associate nations who play cricket. So it would be nice to learn about those associate countries and via the podcast, people can learn more as well. For today's Associate Cricket Series episode, we are discussing all things Japan cricket. Joining me to discuss and talk all things Japan cricket is Alan Kerr. Alan, welcome. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for the intro. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on here, Alan, and and I'm sure everyone will be interested to hear what you have to say about cricket in Japan, Um, something that you don't associate with Japan, cricket, you associate it with other sports uh, that are played around the world. So it would be interesting to hear your insights on all things Japan cricket, and many people would learn from listening to this episode today. But before we talk about that, Alan, uh, I want to talk about your cricketing journey, how you got into this great game that we love. And I do that with all my guests that I've interviewed on the podcast. I'd like to take them back to where it all started for them in the game. It's been interesting listening to their memories and recollections, how they got into cricket. So, Alan, going back to the very beginning, growing up, what were your earliest memories of watching, playing, and even going to the cricket? And who were some of the cricketing idols that you looked up to and admired growing up? Um. So right back to the start, I, I probably didn't have the greatest introduction to the game of cricket. My early memories aren't particularly fond ones. Um, I remember my next door neighbor. Um, I used to go around to his house, um, you know, after school when I was probably six, seven years old. And he'd be sitting in front of the test match, which I had no idea what it was, found it boring. And I made him turn it over to watch some cartoons, which I don't think was particularly... Um, a particularly popular choice but he, he let me do it anyway so i always remember, that was probably my first kind of seeing of cricket because i'd lived in hong kong until i was five um and so when i came back to england we, we didn't play any sports in my primary school that i remember just you know play around running around um and then when i went to um my first uh first i went to boarding school uh, at the age of eight and started playing that was in bath at monkton Coombe, and we played cricket there um so my earliest memories are continuous cricket. And I remember a school trip where we went, we I was down in Devon in England, Southwest. Um, but we did a school trip all the way up to London and we went to Lords and Wembley in the same day. Um, and I remember finding Lords really boring. Um, and I remember finding Wembley really fun. And I went up the stairs at Wembley and lifted the FA cup, which was, you know, very exciting for a sort of nine-year-old. Um, and it's funny, as I grew older, I look back on that day quite a lot. I still like my my football, but um, if I was to do that same tour of Lords now, I, I would appreciate it so much more. Mm. Uh, and I can see the teacher who took us, was well, he was a cricket fan and he was absolutely loving it, but the rest of us were a bit bored. Lords was a bit, you know, stuffy old Lords at the time. It's, it's changed a bit now at least, but... Um, mm. You know, going and seeing the, going into the long room and, and going and seeing the actors. I didn't really know any of it at that time. So as I got older, I started playing a bit more, um, particularly when I was around, I guess, the Ashes series of 93, 94, I'm going to say. And that was followed up by England playing South Africa in 1994 summer. That is probably the summer that I can pinpoint when I really kind of fell in love with the game. I remember we'd played down under that that winter, and I remember Mike Gavin scored a, a hundred in one of the test matches, but England were, were pretty pretty awful. <laughs> but then that series against South Africa, Graham Thorpe made runs, um, and he quickly became someone that I really you know admired and became one of my favourite players. And I remember Devon Malcolm took nine for fifty seven in the final test of the series, um, so England drew one all, and it was South Africa's first series back um, after apartheid. So. I kind of started to learn a little bit about the world through cricket as well. And that's kind of been an ongoing theme of mine. Um, and it probably started there. Um, and, and from there, you know, I then began to play a bit more seriously at school. I started, you know, 
suddenly Shane Warne was was all over the place. I can see him behind you over your left yeah. shoulder, and um, you know I started. Everyone wanted to be a leg spinner in the, in the mid to late nineties, so I was a leg spinner, and um, yeah, had a bit of success at school level. Just you know, second eleven level, nothing nothing particularly glamorous, but um, yeah, really kind of fell in love with the game there, and then I played a bit at uni, uh, and sort of it went from there. Yeah, yeah, but I suppose everyone has a different journey into into cricket. It's very mm. fascinating listening to you uh, recall those memories. And then you ended up working for Japan Cricket. Tell us about how did you end up in the land of the rising sun? Yeah, it's, a, again, a very roundabout story, which I'll try and try and keep on track as possible. <laughs> so after university, um, you know, as, as happens for a lot of people, I guess, you, you scatter off back to your own towns yeah. or cities, wherever you came from, and, and you know, begin your sort of professional life. And one of my friends decided to... Um, put together a cricket team really as an excuse to keep our group of friends together, um, give us a reason to meet up and, you know, relive our uni days a little bit. So the Drovers Cricket Club was born. Um, and over the next few years, that would be a, a reason for us all to get together. We all kind of migrated back towards London anyway, the bulk of players. Uh, bulk of our, we were, I was at uni just outside of um, London in Reading. And so we ended up back in the big city. And um, yeah, most summers we'd get together and play games. And then uh, in 2009, we ended up between a group of us, which includes a whole lot of other people as well. We, we went up to Mount Everest to play a game of cricket, um, which set the world record for the highest ever game of cricket. We raised a load of money for charity. You know, it got, got quite big news, got coverage in, in Australia and other places around the world. And uh, it was, a, it was yeah. an amazing event for us. And off the back of that, I decided I wanted to change careers. Um, and I moved, I'd been working for Flight Center as a travel agent up until that point. I'd done about 10 years there. And I moved into adventure travel. So I did that for the next three years. And that gave me more of a sort of project management experience. And then I got to my early 30s, I was like 31, 32. And I decided that I wanted to, I'd been in travel for, you know, like I say, 10, 11, 12 years by that stage. And, and I wanted to get into sport. Sport had always been my great passion, cricket particularly. I thought, you know, this is my chance. I'm in my early 30s. If I'm going to change career, it's kind of now or never. Mm. So I basically went looking for every job that I could find in sport, um, no matter how sort of um, loosely aligned it was. It's kind of like someone who wants to be a chef working as a waiter, you know. It was kind of that. I was willing to take on that kind of um, slightly abstract route into sport. And funnily enough, the first job I actually applied for was was this one where I ended up. But I applied for a host of others, and they gradually sort of melted away. Um, and I, I'd seen this job. I'd regularly go onto the ICC website or the ECB website, and I'd go onto yeah. various other websites as well um, to see what jobs were there. And this one was being advertised. The, the application date had actually passed, but I emailed the name, the email address that was there, who is now Alex Miyagi, my CEO here, and just said, look, uh, I see the deadline's passed. Would you still accept a an application and he said look if you get your cv in today um then we'll look at it I got the application in that was on a monday on the tuesday um i got heard back had my first interview on the thursday and then a second interview the following thursday and then i had nothing for three weeks um at which point i went on another work trip as i said i was working in adventure travel at the time so i was actually in iraqi kurdistan um on a trek with the travel company i worked for and I'd been out of um, communications for three days. And I came back to the hotel, opened up my emails, and I had, you know, 60-odd emails to work oh. through. Um, and I saw the email from Japan Cricket. And at this point, I'd given up completely. I just kind of figured it wasn't going to happen, and I was just, you know, it was the inevitable rejection letter. So I didn't even open it up straight away. I just started at the top of the emails and just worked through them. And, and eventually, it just popped up as the next email. And the first line I read was, you know, we'd like to offer you the position. I was like, oh, God. So, yeah, it was... Um, it was slightly bizarre but i mean at the time they wanted someone with experience living overseas and i'd spent a bit of time in nepal so after the everest trip i actually went and lived in Kathmandu for three months um and was very keen to um experience living overseas i, I mentioned before we came on the call that i actually spent some of my early years in hong kong i lived there until i was five from two to five yeah. um and i had this itch that I needed scratching and I, I, the trip to Kathmandu didn't really work out as i'd wanted um, I probably hadn't planned it very well. I was 28, 29. I just sort of went over there after the Everest trip and hoped things would work out, um, which uh, it didn't. Uh, visa eventually ran out and 
things just hadn't gone the way I'd wanted. So when this came up, it felt like I was doing it properly this time. I had a job lined up, a place to live was sorted out. And yeah, January 7th, 2014, which is not too far from now, was the day I landed in Japan. Um, I'd been out on holiday here uh, in 2012. I had a friend from uni who was living here, so I, I had a vague idea what I was stepping into. Um, but as far as the cricket side of things went, yeah, I hadn't worked in sport, I hadn't worked in cricket. My experience was in project management, and they wanted someone who could just organize projects and could understand the budget and you know, could oversee a junior development program, which is what the, the role was. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now, that's it's wonderful to hear your story and how you ended up in Japan. and. You're still there and uh, you're still loving living there and getting used to the culture. It's very Yeah, difficult. very much so. I, mean, I think what my story shows more than anything is that really anyone can end up working in sport. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, I was not a player of any standard whatsoever, very much a village cricketer. Um, mm -hmm. I just loved the game and I decided that I would be willing to go wherever it would take me. I didn't have any ties at the time. I didn't have a mortgage. I just about, in fact, my last... Um, my final payment of my student loan was done in November 2013, and I flew out here in, in January 2014. So I flew out here debt-free, you know, unmarried, single, um, no mortgage or anything like that. So really, it was just a bit of a wild punt, and and you know, I do feel like it's paid off because the experiences I've had here, you know, I've met my wife out here, you know, I've got a got a daughter. So yeah, things things have worked out pretty well so far, and hopefully, we can continue growing the sport and more success to come. Absolutely. And as we get into this um into this interview deeper and deeper, we're we're gonna unlock those stories about cricket in Japan and, and how the game's grown and developing. So it was very nice to hear about your cricketing journey and how you ended up working at Japan cricket. Um I thought to uh start this interview on Japan cricket, um Alan is talk about the history of cricket in Japan because you can learn a lot about cricket from its history. And the history of cricket in Japan is quite interesting. Uh, doing some reading about it, it's very quite interesting how it became to be in Japan. So, Alan, give us a brief overview on the history of cricket in Japan. Yeah, so the first recorded um, matches that we have evidence of were in 1863 at the Yokohama Cricket and Athletic Club, as it was called then. Um, Merchant Navy guys playing with pistols in their belts. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that's kind of um, the, the date, the start date, if you like, that we, that we work off here. Um, but then kind of fast forward, you know, 120 years. Um, in the 80s, there was a chap called Professor Yamada who um, had studied abroad and, and was curious that there was this sport that was popular around the world that Japan didn't really know anything about. Um, and he founded the Japan Cricket Association I'm going to say 1984. Um, I'm pretty sure that's when it was. Um, and it was around that time that the University League began to come to life. Um, a chap called Kenny Matsumura um, had a similar story as Professor Yamada. He'd um, been studying overseas sports and found out about cricket and set up his uh, decided to set up a team and learn about it through his university and gradually um these university leagues sort of began um and it's it's probably the longest running competition in in japan i think there likely always been a few expats around who had played but there was no formal structure um the the real changes came in the early 2000s um kenny matsumura was um involved in appointing Naoki Miyagi, I already mentioned, as the first um, part-time staff member um, in uh, 2001, I think. Um, and there were competitions by this stage. There, there was quite a lot of cricket happening. Um, you know, Japan Cricket League was in its early years as a, was, I think it was called Kanto Cricket League at the time. So then things really changed around 2008. Um, we managed to get enough... Um, support and information together to get associate membership rather than affiliate membership of the ICC. Once you get associate membership, I mean, now everyone's an associate member, but back then that wasn't the case. Once you get associate membership, it opens up a lot more funding, um, staff are able to go full time and a bit of an overhaul of some of the competitions were able to, to happen. Um, 
And then off the back of that, things continue to change in that we had um, a bit of success for our women's team. So the, the women's team's first recorded matches were around the early 2000s. Um, they actually played some ODIs. I'm gonna, rather than get this wrong, I'm going to open this up and make sure I actually get it right because uh, I do have this information to hand. Yeah. So the first women's matches were in... Let me see. 2003 in a IWCC trophy. And they were ODIs, and they remain the only one-day internationals that any Japan team has played. Um, yeah. uh, so they played the whole series against the West Indies, Scotland, Netherlands, Ireland, and Pakistan in 2003. The men didn't play their first official matches. or that They played some in 1996 in a um, ACC tournament. Yep. Um, and then they were switched to the ice and oh no, I stayed in the ACC until 1998, played a few games. And then by 2000, um, and let's have a look, 2002, they moved to the East Asia Pacific region um, yep. of the ICC competition. So that made quite a big difference going into the, um, the ICC pathways rather than the ACC ones, which, you know, is something that, um, has, has come to the fore again recently because we're back in the ACC pathways now, but we're able to do both. Back then, you know, it was one or the other. Um, so that led to success in the Asian Games in 2010. The women's team participated. We were only able to send one team, but they went and won a bronze medal. Um, so that led to a lot more promotion, a lot more people hearing about the sport. And it also got the interest of some other countries around the world. So in 2012, it was the 65th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Pakistan and Japan. And they wanted to mark that by doing something. And they brought the Pakistan women's A team to Japan to play the Japan women's team, who they'd heard about through the Asian Games and seen them you know, winning this medal. So they came here, and there was, uh, this abandoned school that I'm in um, hosted this this fixture. And the best part of 2,000 Pakistanis turned up to watch these games. Mm. And the local city businessmen were quite taken aback by this. Um, you know, up until then, the JCA had kind of been based in Tokyo and it had moved out to Sano, where we, we are now, um, probably around that 2008 time, because... There was no point working in Tokyo. There was just, there's no space to build a cricket ground. It was made much more sense to focus on a specific area and try to build a relationship with the city. And that's what this, this tour in 2012 really did. Um, the city council suddenly really got behind cricket, saw the benefits of how it could bring people to the town and help, you know, regenerate life a little bit here. Japan is full of these, um, rural areas which have declining populations and mm -hmm. struggle to really um, have have a reason for people to visit. Um, so cricket and Sano City have worked together for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years now to develop sport here, to bring people here, to boost the economy. And every time we host a tournament, that's numerous teams staying in hotels, that's um, eating in restaurants, shopping at the, the shopping centres and the local stores. So... You know, the, we've had great support from the city, and that's really played its part um, in helping develop things. And like I say, I arrived in 2014, so I can speak a lot more authoritatively on what's happened since then. And, you know, the game's gone from strength to strength. We've restructured a lot of the domestic competitions over these 10 years. The Japan Cricket League, when I arrived, was, I think, two divisions with maybe sort of six or seven teams in each. Uh, the Japan Cup was two regions with, again, eight or nine teams in each. Now the Japan Cricket League has three divisions with 32 teams and the Japan Cup has seven regions and more than 60 teams. Um, there was no junior pathway competitions. You went from under 12 softball cricket to playing senior adult cricket. Whereas now there's an under 15 league, there's an under 19 league. Um, and as that continues to grow, hopefully we can, we can do more in that space, maybe an under 17 league in the future, who knows. Um, you know, the Women's League is, is still in existence. There's more women's programs. Uh, the junior programs, the Cricket Blast program is what I came over here to 
to um, set up back in 2014. That's that's still running and had, I think I saw the other day, I was running the numbers at about 600 participants go through that this year. Um, so yeah, you know, it's it's developing and, and the, the way the organization has grown from having, you know, one part-time member of staff 20 years ago to having, I don't know, I think we're at about 14 or 15 full-time staff now. Um, it's still not a huge organization, but trying to remember that journey of where we've come from and, and thinking about where we're trying to get to is is really important. Absolutely. It just shows that if you put the time and effort and hard work in, you can achieve something and you, you're yeah, starting definitely. to do that over there in Japan, which is fantastic. So it was good to hear a, a brief overview on the history of cricket in Japan uh, from you there, Alan. Um, I thought we'd talk about the national teams, women's and men's, uh, Alan, for our next topic of this discussion. And um, be good to gain your insights on the two teams, learn more about their achievements, the stories of the players, because many of the players come from diverse backgrounds, upbringings, and they have their own story and journey to tell. So, Alan, for those who may not know a lot about the Japan women's and men's teams, can you tell us a bit more about them, the players, and some of their stories? Yeah, well, we'll start with the women's team, I guess. Um, we've mentioned them already in that they, they had that success at the Asian Games in 2010. Um, at the moment, yeah, there's a, a nice mix in the women's team. There's players who have been around for a while, but as it tends to be the case in women's cricket, we have a lot of young players as well. Um, we've tried quite hard to target players from other sports um, to come in and, and bring their skills that they might have from playing softball, baseball, um, tennis, whatever it might be. Um, so at the moment, we have Erica Odo is probably the, the senior player in the team. She only started playing cricket in 2016 um, as a 30, 31-year-old. Um, she'd been a, she played a bit of softball, baseball as a kid, and she'd also been a javelin thrower. Um, so she she has the power, um, and she's, she's very much our leading batter at the moment. We went to the... Um, regional tournament for the ICC World Cup qualifier in Vanuatu earlier this year. And, you know, we came a, a comfortable fourth out of seven teams. We were um, very much ahead of the three teams below us, but there was a bit of a gap between the three teams above us as well. But Erica still finished as a second leading run scorer in that tournament and, and was only, you know, a handful of runs away from being leading run scorer, which shows that, you know, she is definitely able to mix it with the best players in this region. Um, and that include, included Papua New Guinea, who have been the standout women's team in the region for a long, long time, although they did slip up in that tournament, and uh, Vanuatu actually ended up going through, which was a bit of a surprise. Um, so Erica's been doing really well. She's, she's been over to New Zealand and played a couple of winters. She's been to England and done a bit of a summer over there as well. So, you know, she balances her work with, um, with her cricket commitments. She's actually off to, we haven't announced this yet, hopefully announcing it in the next few days, she's actually off to South Africa. Um, next week with two other players um, to play in a domestic tournament that's happening in January, uh, just a three-day T20 tournament called the Global Cricket Tournament, hosted by Cricket South Africa. We've built a partnership with Titans Cricket, um, and they've kind of been leading the charge on that and helped get us involved. So that should be really exciting. She's going with Akari Nishimura um, and Elena Kasuda, who are two other players who um, are, are on, the, on the up. Akari is another one who came from a different sport, we did a talent ID day at her university, uh, Sendai University. We created a partnership with them. They're a sports university up north. Um, and we've been supporting cricket in that region ever since the Great Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami in 2011. Um, so that's the area where, where they're from. And it's part of that Cricket for Smiles partnership that was set up around that time. Um, and uh, yeah, I currently came through that and was the first player from that university to represent Japan. There's been a few others since. Um, She's also been given a, a contract at the fair break um, invitational, um, she, which went along this year. She got an injury, unfortunately, before the first game, got hit by a stray ball on the hand and wasn't able to play. But even just being there and having the experience yeah. of being around professional players was, was great for her. Um, she's come back and brought that learning back to, to the group, which is really important. Um, and Elena's uh, one of the players who's, we'll probably get onto a little bit more with the men's side, but we have had quite a lot of half Japanese players who might have grown up overseas but are wanting to engage with cricket in Japan. And Elena um, moved over here in October. She's taken up a role with the Japan Cricket Association as our female cricket development officer. Um, so she's going 
sort of to get the playing experience, but also to just see how they're running women's cricket over there in South Africa and to learn a little about about that and bring that back. So, yeah, those three will be um, taking part in that event, which will be interesting. We have uh, Hilia Shandell, who's another half, she's half Japanese, half Indian, born and raised in Melbourne, in Sydney, sorry. Um, yep. So she spent all her, her sort of career living in Australia and is coming through there and doing doing pretty well. She's a left arm seamer and sort of middle lower order batter. So she's definitely one to, to keep an eye on as well. And and probably the other player that I'd mention is Haruna Iwasaki. So Haruna is another Sendai University player. Um, she's one of those players who can clear the ropes, um, which is you know really valuable in, in women's cricket, particularly where we are. Players who can hit over the top of the infield. She's a, a dynamite fielder. Uh, as well, had a bit of a hand injury this year, so she's um, that's the reason she's not going to South Africa. But she's still very, very young, still 22, I think. Um, she'll finish university early next year, probably. And she's someone who I think that she you can tell she's got background in other sports, and so her yeah. technique needs a little bit of work. Um, but we played a game against China in the East Asia Cup back in May, and she's walked out and hit her first ball for six, which there's, there's not many players doing that, um, especially in women's cricket. Um, yeah. So she's a bit of a point of difference for us. Um, and at her age, she's someone that we're quite excited about because she could really hopefully take the game on to another level. And for the women's team, you know, the hard part is retaining players because a lot of the players yeah. only pick up the sport at university. The, the women's university competition is still quite strong here. Um, and so anyone who's got a bit of talent, you know, there's probably only you know, probably barely into three figures in terms of numbers of people playing hardball cricket in Japan at the female yeah. level. So the talent pool is is not deep and therefore players often cycle through quite quickly. They, they, they come in at university and they stop playing again when they finish. Particularly yeah. the working life in Japan is challenging. It's very demanding. People work very long hours. They often work weekends. There's very little time for training and even less time for playing and even less time for going on tours, especially the amount of tours that we've had. I mean, the women's team have been on three tours this year, which is great, yeah. but that is time off work, it's time out of school or uni or whatever. So yeah. trying to balance all that it is a big part of our challenge, and that's for the men and the women's team. Um, so we do have big drop-offs of players, but but it does hurt a bit more at the girls because there's just a, a smaller talent pool. Um, so they will be competing in their first Asian Cricket Council tournament um, early next year, hopefully, in Q1. Those are always available to watch on the ACC YouTube stream, which is a good place to see it. And we we are streaming a bit of women's cricket ourselves. Um, we started the Women's Japan Premier League this year, and we invited a few players from overseas to come over. We had a couple of players from the Titans in South Africa come over. We had some players from Australia come over and a couple of players from Hong Kong. So that just helped lift the standard of that competition. And we're going to do that again next year. So... Fingers crossed, that's another success and just helps expose our players a bit more to a higher standard of domestic cricket because we, we realise that that's what they need to do if they're going to develop um, along the, the lines that we want them to. Um, then for the men's side, um, yeah, it's been interesting. I mean, actually, I will just say one other thing about the women's team. We had two players debut in the last tournament in Hong Kong um, who I think... They're probably not the first because Katrina Keenan played for the women's team. And she also played for New Zealand, but she was coaching the women's team for a while and she qualified on residency. Yeah. But the two girls who debuted, Srinali Renard and Palak Gundachar, um, two Indian girls who um, have become the first Indian-born players to, to represent Japan. Um, and, you know, the, the Japanese side has always been, you know, 100% Japanese. Um, so you mentioned the diverse background. It's not quite the same in the women's game. Yeah. Um, but it is good to see that I think Palak, Palak may even have been born in Japan. I'd have to check. She certainly lived here a very long time and learning the game here. So, um, you know, she's only, I think she's only 15. Um, so having players like that, it just, it will, it will help capture the imagination of a new audience, I hope. Um, because, you know, you want, you want to be inspiring new players to play the game and, I'm very aware that there is a huge amount of talented female sports people out there that we need to access. Um, and we just need to be putting cricket in front of them. And, and hopefully the Olympics announcement will help with that. Mm. Yeah. Um, the men's team has really gone from strength to strength. When I first arrived, um, there was a lot of um, rulings around only picking players 
who had Japanese passports and were playing domestic cricket in Japan. Um, yeah. We talked just off air about Kendall Kadawaki Fleming, who's our captain. Kendall, uh, we knew about Kendall from around 2015, I think, um, but we weren't able to pick him until 2019, until we changed our selection policy. Um, at that time, we were not picking players who did not play in Japan, regardless yeah. of their, their heritage or, or background. So Kendall um, is one of many who fits into a, a mold that has become well, it's, become, it's, just, it's just more and more of this this per, the type of person who was born in Japan. Yep. He was born down in Fukuoka. Um, he lived here till he was six, seven years old. And then his family moved back to Brisbane and he grew up and learned his cricket there. Yep. Kendall's played first grade cricket since he was about 20 years old in, in Brisbane. You know, he's 27 years old now. He's scored the first T20 hundred for Japan. Um, you know, it's... It's a surprise to most of us that he hasn't played professional cricket. I mean, he is a very good player. If he was English, he'd have had a county contract. I can be fairly confident of that. Um, I read an article recently someone did on him that his stats in grade cricket in first grade in Brisbane are almost identical to Marnus Labuschagne's. Wow. Um, so, you know, the, the guy can play. Oh. Um, so... He's come in and he was kind of the first and he he actually came with us. The Japan Under-19 team qualified for the Under-19 World Cup in 2020. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. But Kendall um, came over here and, and did some coaching with the boys uh, and then went to South Africa with us as, a, as an assistant coach as well. Um, yeah. So he put in, he's really passionate about Japan cricket. He's put in a lot of time to it. He continues to do so now. He's, um, he's even, you know, taken. he's got a pretty serious job. Uh, back in Brisbane, but he's even gone down to four days a week to, to put more time into Japan cricket over the last few months. So yeah. that's how, how passionate he is. And he's still only 27 years old. And, you know, we've seen him. He's the kind of player who can mix it with the top level players in the associate game. Yeah. So um, having someone like that on our side is a real asset. And of course, that brings leadership and now some knowledge, which from the years that I was, I didn't really get involved in the high performance stuff until 2016. Um, but we had definitely a vacuum in that that's that area. Um, yeah. We were picking 100% Japanese players, so you had to be a passport holder and living in Japan. Um, yeah. And, you know, look, there was a lot of good players there who were still learning the game, and they, they just didn't have that sort of leadership and that game yeah. experience. Um, I mentioned Elena Kasuda. Um, Rayo Sakurano Thomas is another in a very similar position. Rayo um, was born here as well in... Um, he was born down in uh, uh, the names escape me, um, but he's he moved over here. He moved back to New Zealand sorry, when he was six, and then he came back two years ago um, to take up a position with us and work as a development officer. So he's immediately shown himself as as another leader and another get player with a lot of knowledge. He took uh, five for on his um, T20 international debut, um, and I mean Kendall scored a hundred on his. ICC debut. Um, we played a few games prior to that, and he'd made runs. But the video of the highlights of that have gone over half a million views now on YouTube. So oh. that's one to look at. Um, but Ray is an all rounder. Um, probably hasn't done as much with the bat in the Japan shirt yet as he'd like. But he's doing well in domestic cricket here with the bat. But he's um, more more known as a sort of a swing bowler. Um, and then. Ever since that, there's been more and more of those type of players who who might have one Japanese parent and been born here or, or born overseas. And, you know, there's a great satisfaction that I have in that these players, these kids who, for whatever reason, they, they would come to Japan every year, usually as children, to see their Japanese family. Yep. But then COVID hit and that stopped all that. So for, oh. they had a big, big vacuum of sort of two, three years where at a crucial time in their lives at sort of aged... 17, 18, 19, where they didn't come to Japan and perhaps got a bit separated from that. So a lot of these kids, they, they're Japanese. They might understand a bit of Japanese, but they might not speak that much of it. Um, but now they um, are reconnecting with Japan through cricket. They come over here, they meet people, they make their friends, they engage with um, the cricket community here. And and look, it's great that they a lot of these guys are talented cricketers. You know, Lachlan Yamamoto Lake scored 60-odd against uh, Cambodia in the Asian Games. Um Ryan Drake's taking wickets against Vanuatu, uh, seen bowler in Sydney. Um, Declan Suzuki, I could go on. There's a whole load of these guys um, 
who are all coming through and they're all friends with each other and they're all engaging with um the japan yeah this culture they, and they, they want to come back and be part of it so that's been really exciting to see and um if there's players who only come for the social that's fine too i don't we don't necessarily we're not scouring the world for high performance cricketers to come and make our national team better these guys are coming to us we really haven't gone out looking for it at all and yeah. a big part of that is from the under 19 success so the under 19 team as i mentioned um actually i'll just finish off on the men so this year the men in october 2022 they won the sub-regional um icc qualifier for the world cup so there's yeah two qualifying tiers to get to the World Cup. There's a sub-regional and then a regional final. So we're in the East Asia Pacific region. So we play in the sort of um, East Asia part. So the Philippines, Indonesia, Korea, Japan. Um, and then on the Pacific side, there's Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Cook Islands, Fiji, Samoa um, playing down there. So we, we won the sub-regional in October and then we went to Papua New Guinea for the regional final uh, this year. And we beat Vanuatu for the first time in, I don't know, 10, 12 years, I think. Um, and we finished second in that tournament behind Papua New Guinea. And, you know, you win that tournament, you go to the T20 World Cup. So yeah. there's only one team ahead of us for a World Cup place. So that shows how far we've come. I mean, that was not something that was even on our radar five years ago. Um, and our team is predominantly under the age of 27. Um, so it's a young team. The Papua New Guinea team is not a young team. You know, Asad Vala is still very much their main player. He's 38 years old, I think. Um, so, you know, they've, they've had a long time, a long run uh, as the champions in the EAP region, and we're very much hoping to, to usurp them in that role and, and start getting some of these World Cup experiences for our senior men's team. So it might, it might be a few more years yet, but it's definitely something that we're targeting. Um, and that, that's really exciting because, you know, most of our players, as I say, they're still... 20, 22 years old, um, and Kendall there as the leader, you know, is, is a good good person to sort of take the group forward. Um, but yeah, the under 19s. So when I came to Japan, I, my original role was to set up a junior cricket program for under 12s, cricket blast, yeah. called still called, and we rolled that out over the first two years, and that was an ICC funded program, which. Um, that program was the funding was pulled out at the end of two years it was supposed to be four years it lasted two um and that's when my role changed and i moved into head of cricket operations which i am now yeah um, so those first two years i was very focused on junior cricket and getting that program set up i wasn't really paying much attention to our domestic structures or our high performance stuff i was aware of it but i wasn't involved um whereas now i'm very much involved in everything um so well, we had a plan for the um 2021 um well no the 2020 world cup qualifier so the goal was to set up a team in 2018 compete in the 2019 under 19 world cup qualifier for the first time in eight years and the team that we picked for that was very young only three players aged out um for the following cycle so the idea was to go into that, get some experience, and then really have a go at qualifying for the World Cup two years later. Um, as it turned out, we won that World Cup qualifier um, with the young team that we had and went off to South Africa in early 2020. We were in South Africa just as COVID was starting. Um, and we went to that World Cup and, you know, we lost every game, but it was a great experience. And it really, that is what got Japan cricket on the map, I feel, to a much wider audience. And ever since then, We've got people contacting us saying, you know, my son, my daughter plays cricket in Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, England, wherever it might be. We didn't realize there was cricket in Japan. Can, can we get involved somehow? Um, I mean, I had a call this week from another an 11 year old in England playing at one of the top clubs in, in, um, in yep. the north. So it just keeps on keeps on coming. Um, and so this year, um, the under 19 team went and played in the ICC World Cup qualifier. They came second in that, but they beat Papua New Guinea um, again. So they came second because New Zealand were in it. New Zealand had not been able to compete in the Under-19 World Cup the previous cycle because of COVID restrictions. They didn't send their team, which meant that they had to qualify this time, which meant yep. they took the spot that would traditionally go to an associate member. 
which still fills me with rage because, the, as I said, our long-term plan had been for that World Cup. Yeah. And the team that we would have put into that would have been good. It would have been genuinely good. It would have won games at a World Cup. Um, so that was a huge disappointment. But, you know, with every setback, you, you move things forward and a lot of those players have been accelerated into the full men's team. Um, and so the team now is led by Koji Hargrave Abe, who's another half Kiwi. Um, and they've gone out and done done very, very well. They, they played in that tournament, came second. They won all the other games. They then went to the ACC, um, Asian Cricket Council Premier Cup. Um, one of the reasons for taking part in that was really to show teams in the other region that there are stronger teams in the EAP. Because one of the conversations that, get, that gets had at sort of ICC AGMs is that the teams from some regions aren't as strong as others. And so the Asia, t Asia region should have more teams okay. getting World Cup places. And, you know, for me, a World Cup should be a World Cup. It should be a global tournament that features teams from every region. And I'd yeah. say that. I'd say that regardless of where I'm based. That's what the Football World Cup is. You know, why shouldn't cricket be like that? Um, and so the 16 team under 19 World Cup has had the same structure for a really long time and it, it makes it attainable for us and it gives us something to to really work towards. Um, you know, just be the best in the region. Um, so then going over to the ACC to compete against those other teams will help us perform better should we qualify for the next under 19 World Cup. Um, so we went over there, we beat the hosts, Malaysia, on day one. Um, we played against Indonesia, who we'd already beaten in, in the ICC qualifier. And then we beat Hong Kong, um, which put us into the semi-finals. We lost in Nepal, um, but then bounced back and beat Singapore in the final game to qualify for the Asia Cup. And that's the first time a Japan team's ever qualified for the Asia Cup. And I would say that qualifying for the Asia Cup is actually harder than qualifying for a World Cup. Because yeah. to qualify for a World Cup, you basically got to get past Papua New Guinea, who are the strongest team in the region. But to qualify for the Asia Cup, you've got to get past all those teams I've just mentioned who yeah. are all re relatively established associate nations with good pathways and good um, development structures and coaching programs. We're still very much developmental in that, that area. So, yeah. And lots of players to look out for coming through there. You know, Koji, Hargrave Abe, I mentioned, but Kiefer Yamamoto Lake, the younger brother of, of Lachlan, um, has gone really well. He's set records for the amount of wickets taken by an under 19 bowler. Uh, Kazuma Kato Stafford um, has already been called up to the men's squad once uh, for the Asian Games. Um, he's only 16. Charlie Hins is only 15 and made a big mark. Um, those two boys are both boys living in, um, well, all those guys are living in Australia. Um, so that makes it a bit difficult for us to get our group together. But, you know, we've got um, Shotaro Hilatsuka has done pretty well, both with the bat and with the ball. Um, and Nikhil Pol who's um, Indian heritage, but has a Japanese passport and has lived here since he was very, very small, learned all his cricket in Japan. He's a player we're pretty excited about. He wasn't able to go to the Asia Cup because of uh, school exams, which was kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> but he's only 16. He's a big kid, um, bats and bowls. He's, he's someone we're genuinely excited about. So, you know, these... Um, there's a lot of talent coming through and I think we are going to see some of those boys making their way into the full men's team pretty soon and it just shows for a, a, an even brighter future as, as we progress you know we're going to be playing in the division one for the East Asia Pacific ICC qualifiers um, in 2025 and we will also have another go at the Asia Cup at the back end of next year whenever that is decided so um, yeah there's lots of opportunities for these boys and um yeah, it should be, should be exciting times for them. And the opportunity to travel and see the world and play cricket, you know, it's such a great um, carrot to be able to offer these kids as motivation to to have and to learn about the world through the game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just listening to you speak about the national teams and what they've achieved and the talent coming through and Obviously, Kendall, obviously a, a great example of leadership qualities as well. It's it, it's fantastic to have that sort of at your doorstep, isn't it? Um, and you well, it is. Yeah, access to those kind of people who who can drive things as well, because our coaching staff is small. You know, we only have a handful of coaches, so you do need things. I mean, any sports team to be successful will tell you it really needs to be player led. Um, the coaches can 
can build a framework, but actually once you're on the field, the coach isn't there, you know, so the players themselves, that they need to be, you know, we'll have coaching training camps where we'll bring all the players together, but we can't control what the players are doing Monday to Friday. Um, and that's when they need to be eating right and training well. And and that's where having someone like Kendall who kind of has an understanding of what players need to be doing can just help sort of, you know, people will look up to what he does and um, and copy it. Yeah, great role model, that discipline, you know, to be yeah, the best absolutely. you can be. Sort of like these, um, you know, like Marnus Labashain or Steve Smith or Virat Kohli. You know, mm. how do they get to number one in the world? Discipline and training and working hard. Yeah. So, yeah, as you said, that's that's fantastic to have a role model and a leader um, who demonstrates that to a very young group who, mm. who are developing as not only as creators, but as men as well. Well, that's it. You know, we want to create people or, or help people develop in, in the right way. And they want we want them to be role models for cricketers in Japan. We want them to be living and breathing our values of, you know, living the spirit of cricket, as it were, to, to simplify it. Um, because it's really important that these players, um, they're the ones who are the flagship for cricket in Japan. And, and Japanese culture demands a certain amount of, well, a certain element of respect and it demands a certain style of behavior, if you like, um, from its sports people. Um, but we've seen that the rugby team, for example, they've really been able to capture that and, and win over people despite being not 100% Japanese. There's a lot of players in that side who have qualified through residency. Um, even the captain, Michael Leach, you know, there's, he doesn't have any Japanese blood in him, but he's lived in Japan since he was 16. He's not captain anymore, but he was when we hosted the World Cup here. And, you know, he's um, he speaks the language fluently and everything. And he's very much um, someone that everyone, young kids, are all looked up to. Um, and to see non a non-Japanese person representing Japan and having that impact is quite a big deal because, yeah. you know, Japan has always been quite sort of monocultured for a long, long time. And that is changing. Um and we're, we're lucky to be at the front of that. And, you know, whilst people say that our team is incredibly diverse, you know, we only have two guys in the squads, uh, in the current squads, who don't have Japanese passports. And that's Sabara Travichandran, who's been named Japan's Cricketer of the Year five times in the last seven years. So he's definitely earned it. And Piyush Kambare, who's a left-arm spinner, who's taken wickets and, and bowled with quality, great economy rate everywhere he's gone. So... You know, the, the, when we are picking players who are not Japanese, um, who don't have Japanese heritage, they, they have to have a really strong connection to the country anyway and, yeah. be, and be thriving in domestic cricket over here. So, um, again, the characters and the um, personalities of the players that we pick, they, they all matter as well. Yeah, and I suppose it's the same for the women's team as well. Mm, yeah, very much so. The, um, the leadership that we have, I mean, actually our... Our captain, Maya Nagida, she's just moved to Melbourne. Um, so she's been playing cricket for the Japan team since 2012, I think, maybe 2011. Um, and she's now gone over there. So she's just going to keep developing as a, as a cricketer. Um, and, and as a coach, she's actually doing some of her coaching stuff at the moment. She's still in the early 30s. Um, and um, that, that, will, that will only help her. And she's a good example to the players of someone who can, has managed to work their passion around their job, you know, yeah. just because she's got a busy career doesn't mean she's going to give up playing cricket because that's what she loves. Um, yeah. And it's, it's great when you have people who are able to do that and make it work for them because it does set an example for, for the other players that it's possible. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit hard because um, you don't have central contracts um, and full-time professionals. It's often a hard thing to try and keep people involved in the sport. Well, it's not just that. It's it's not that it's, they're not being paid. It's they're actually paying to play. You know, there are there are fees involved with being with the national team. So, you know, you are out of pocket when you play for Japan. It's something we're really trying to change. And, you know, this Olympics announcement is a, is a huge bit of news for us, and that will hopefully open up some more funding avenues, and maybe we can do something with that. We're, we're, that's all still TBC. We're trying to work it all out at the moment. But, um, you know, things are beginning to move and beginning to change a little bit. So... Yeah, hopefully some of these players will will be, you know, um, gaining some kind of financial support. Um, and the long-term future, of course, is to have a professional setup and professional competition and players who are full-time cricketers. Um, that's, 
that's the dream. Not sure how long it's going to take us to get there, but um, yeah. we'll get there in the end. Absolutely. And I suppose just going back onto the Olympics is it would have been big if it was in the Tokyo Games. Yeah, Wouldn't it? It would have been big for Japan if that was the case in hindsight. But I no, suppose we, we tried very hard, but you know, it's it's not, it's not up to us. It's very much the powers that be at the yep. the ICC and and, and, they, and actually the, the ECB, Cricket Australia, and the BCCI, who at that time weren't aligned, but somehow that has managed to change. Yeah, absolutely, and it definitely benefit associate cricket. Um, do a lot of people turn out to watch the teams when they play at home in Japan? Do you get good crowds? Um, yeah, look, we've we've got crowds, you know, in, into the four figures. Um, yeah, I'd say we, we'd probably like what we'd actually like to get more of is the Japan cricket community coming to watch the games. Yeah, and um, we managed to attract. You know, we get a bit creative. We we try and hold other events whilst there are games on. So, yeah. for example, in 2022. There was a local Matsuri, local festival, which we ran at the same time um, as the tournament being on. And, and the estimate was about 18,000 people came through the gates over the two days. Um, yeah. And it certainly felt like there were a lot of people around. So that helps. Um, you know, the teams haven't played at home this year. Um, all of our tournaments have been overseas, so we haven't had a lot. But, you know, we have a, a tournament at the end, a domestic tournament it's called the Embassy Cup in October every year where we have... So we put out a Japan team, it's sort of a, a Japan A, if you like, um, and we, we, you know, we get half decent crowds to that. But we always want to get more. Um, but actually, what we have seen is that a lot of people are watching our products on the live stream. You know, whether it's on yeah. YouTube or through Fan Code in India, we, we are um, we're, we're streaming a lot of cricket now. So you know that that helps people get to know who the players are, and um, you know the, uh, the domestic standard. Um, people can see that. So, so yeah, there, there's a lot of people watching Japan cricket and a lot of people becoming more and more knowledgeable about it. Um, we still want to get the, the those core Japanese fans. You mentioned at the start of this podcast, it's some, something that uh, I hear a lot of is that how Japan's not, you wouldn't expect Japan to play cricket. It's like, well, mm. you know, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, why not? Um, just because we don't know it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that Japanese people don't have a, a natural aptitude for the sport. So we've got to tap into that as, you know, we've got plenty of guys in our team still who are 100% Japanese, guys and girls, who have grown up playing the game and, and, and love it as, uh, just as much as you and I do. They might not have the same understanding of the history of the sport because all the history books are written in English. Um, yeah. But but that will come and they will, you know, our leg spinner, Makoto Taniyama, he's been playing since he was, you know, 12, 13 years old. He taught himself how to bowl by watching videos of Warney on YouTube. Um, yeah. You know, and he's one of Japan's leading wicket takers. So, you know, it, it's putting the, the game in front of people in a way that they can consume it, learn about it, and then go out and play it and enjoy it in the same way that we do. Uh, I think yeah. everyone deserves that, that opportunity. And that's kind of what I've been trying to do for the last 10 years is just provide opportunities, whether that's for you know, eight to 12 year old kids or whether it's for the national team players or just the cricket community in general, the more opportunities we can provide, the more avenues there are for people to be involved and hopefully fall in love with the game. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It was great to hear your thoughts on, on the national teams of, of Japan, women's and men's. And I'm, and I'm sure everyone listening and watching this episode of the podcast today would learn more as well, want, wanting to learn more and probably watch a few games and see how the teams go about their business on the field and uh, whatever success they may have. Um, I thought we talk about the growth and development of cricket in Japan, uh, Alan. We've already touched on a little bit about that. In terms of getting cricket into local communities, clubs, schools, grassroots, etc., it's one of the biggest challenges facing associate cricket members and nations, Alan, around the world. Uh, how do they try and promote a sport which is so foreign in a country that doesn't understand how the game works so I'm, I'm sure you've answered those questions and try to find ways of doing that you know how do people go down to their local park go to the nets play a game of cricket domestically for their state or province or club on a saturday or sunday like we do in the uk or australia um getting cricket into schools how do they how do they um you know incorporate that in there making cricket accessible so people can watch it on tv or or streaming, as we mentioned before. So, Alan, what 
challenges does Japan, the, the Japan Cricket Association have in trying to grow and develop uh, cricket in the Japanese community? And do you see cricket becoming uh, a mainstream sport in Japan anytime soon? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, anytime soon is a, is a big, um, you know, a, a big step. Um, but having the Olympics ha has really helped. What we need really is, at the moment, it's just been approved as a one-off sport for LA 28. Yeah. Now, Brisbane are hosting the Olympics in 2032. Yeah. So they're pretty confident that cricket would remain. Um, and then 2036, you know, there are rumours that India might be hosting the Olympics. Um, and if that were to happen, then that gives us, you know, from now to 2036, that's 13 years, 12, 13 years of cricket as an Olympic sport. And that sustained funding and support. And if, if, if that would be enough to then get it to become a permanent Olympic sport, um, that is, a, again, a big shift in attitude. The way that associate countries, non-traditional cricketing countries view the sport would change, um, rightly or wrongly. It's one of these things that bugs us a little bit because you know, there's lots of people trying to like, oh, cricket's a real sport now because it's in the Olympics. It's like, no, cricket is one of the biggest sports in the world and it has been for a really long time. Um, but it, it, that is a matter of perception. And what we need is that sustained funding, um, sustained level of interest, we actually were quite lucky that in 20, I'm going to say 2022, I think it was late 2022, there was a um, cross-party parliamentary group established to study the benefits of cricket and how it could be used in, you know, developing young people in Japan. Um, so that was a huge step towards hopefully getting cricket into the curriculum to be taught properly in schools. So we have a structure in Japan where we have regional associations. So throughout Kanto, we have Northeast, Southwest. Um, we have Kansai down in uh, sort of the Osaka region and a handful of others as well, Toku and Tokai. Um, so we want each of those regions to build out their own capacity and, and become, you know, our state provinces. Um, now, you know, facilities is an issue. There's not enough places to play. There's not enough places to train. We've had um, an agreement with a local city in Western Tokyo called Akashima for more than 10 years, but there's still nowhere to play. There's still nowhere where the kids can practice with a hard ball, um, which makes it really, really difficult. Now, Sano City, as I mentioned, has been super supportive. We've got seven cricket grounds up here, but we're, we're a rural town, you know, an hour and a half outside of Tokyo. Akashima is just a, a suburb of Tokyo. There's just not that much space, but... There are places we just need to put some netting up. You know, it's not that hard, yeah. um, but someone's going to agree to do that. And the more the cricket is understood, the more that it is part of people's vocabulary, you know, knowing what cricket is, it's, it's not, they don't hear the word and think of the insects they, they, or the um, clothing brands. They hear the word and think of the sport. So if we can get that happening, um, get people, and, and it is, like it is, it's improved so much since when I, from when I came. Um, it's in the media a lot more. Um, the Asian Games helped. You know, the men's team went to China and competed in the Asian Games. And we won our first game. And it was all over the news in Japan and highlights being shown. And, and that's great. We, we need more of that sort of stuff. So, you know, there is an understanding that, yes, cricket's in the Olympics, but there's only going to be six teams. So Japan aren't going to be in it anytime soon. That's fine. Um, it doesn't matter. The goal is for us to try and get there. I don't mind the pathway being hard, but a pathway has to exist. And up until now, yeah. it hasn't, but now it does. So um, that, that gives us something to aim for. Um, so certainly over the coming years, you know, we've got cricket in the curriculum in Sano and in Akashima, our two sort of main cities of cricket, and we're working on getting it into some of our other ones. Um, but we have to grow our um, coaching capacity. We need teachers to be able to deliver. Um, and, you know, people pick it up pretty quickly, and we've got lots of resources. It's just getting people to take it up. Um, and that, that will need support from the top. That will have to come from you know, the government and the, um, the yeah, boards of education around the various regions. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see a, a lot of people coming out to volunteer for their local club in their local area, uh, helping out a lot? Have you One of the issues we have, so in, in, in traditional cricket playing countries, right, you have this swathe of 
for want of a better term, old guys, <laughs> people who might have stopped playing, people sort of yeah. my age, sort of, um, who might have been done with their playing career, but they they still love cricket and they want to be involved. And they're your administrators, your umpires, your scorers. They're the ones throwing balls at, at younger players, um, feeding a bowling machine. C because cricket is still a young sport in Japan, we don't have that. Um, the Japanese players who have traditionally played, once they stop playing, they disappear. We don't, we've really struggled to keep them involved. And that's yeah. an ongoing challenge um, that we hope can change. Um, but it's, it won't change quickly. It'll take 20 years. <laughs> um, but building that that capacity is, is, is difficult and it's something that we really want to do. That being said, we are having people popping up in quite surprising places. You say, oh yeah, I played cricket at school when I was in Sano and now I'm working in Tokyo in this company and my company's interested in cricket, so I've got the job. And it's like, well, that's great. That you never quite know how the people you've accessed as kids, you know, we accessed, before COVID, we were accessing 15,000 kids a year, giving them a cricket experience. And some of those would be multiple opportunities and some might be a one-off. But that's the kind of numbers we're reporting of anyone who's picked up a bat, basically. And so you never know. And that, that's all part of, as I say, putting cricket as in the vocabulary of the nation. Um, so, you know, at the moment, all those older Japanese guys, they're all delivering baseball. So we just need to, we need to change that. Yeah. Have you noticed that as well? That was the question I was going to bring up because Japan, obviously softball and baseball is quite popular over in Japan. Yeah. And people would say, oh, it's very similar to cricket. Have you noticed people crossing over from the, from, from that side of the sporting uh, a little bit to cricket. Not, not as much as we'd like. We had um, Shogo Kimura, who was a uh, pro baseballer for 15 years, and he switched to cricket at the age of 36, and, and he came into the national squad, and you know he he played in the Asian Games actually this year. Always a lot of media interest around Shogo. He's into his early 40s now, so he's you know, he's still he was in the JCL, the Japan Cricket League Team of the Year this year. He's turned himself into a pretty good club cricketer, um, but whether he's going to be able to excel. To a high level is, is yeah. it's difficult when you start so so late yeah. but you know we have had a couple of people switch from um at a younger age and, and we would like to see more of that um particularly in the women's game i think is where you can make the quickest inroads because um you know as i mentioned before there, there's plenty of really talented females playing sport out there who who might just not not want to proceed with softball careers baseball careers and so we can get them playing cricket and show them particularly the trajectory that women's cricket is on globally and the opportunities that exist um there's no reason why they can't bridge that gap quite fast with the men's team it's a bit men's cricket's a bit harder because you know techniques are ingrained pretty young and yeah. um you know bowlers are able to probably exploit a lack of technique and batter pretty quickly um, yeah but um certainly at, at regional level at least I think when you've got a handful of girls, I mentioned Erica and Haruna earlier, you've got a couple of girls who can clear the ropes, it, it makes a big difference. So um, we actually do want to have more of a program targeting those. And that's kind of what the Sendai University program was. And we want to do a bit more of that with other universities. And hopefully having a women's cricket development officer in place for the first time will help with that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the plan. Um, in the men's, you know, we'll, we'll see. We may well get some 16 to 18 year olds and, and we could perhaps do something there. Um, but any any older than that, it, it's it's difficult to to turn them into something that could really compete at the top level. We had a chap called Musashi Yamamoto. He was um, again a pro baseballer, but hadn't quite made it into the top league. And he switched to cricket, and he gave it three years, and he was going okay. Um, he was scoring runs domestically in Japan on synthetic pitches, but once he started playing on on the, the turf, the grass wickets, um, yeah, he, he found out pretty quickly and. And he switched to golf and played golf after three years. So, so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. As you said, it's very difficult to try and uh, change someone from one sport to the other. But that, that's mm. quite an interesting uh, thing, I suppose. When when people play baseball and and try cricket as well, they say, "Oh, there's a lot of similarities." So I thought there was going to be a huge mm. number of people to take it up. But it's interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Um, another question is, do People have um, good access to equipment. Uh, you know, obviously, mm. cricket, cricket equipment is quite expensive. It's very hard to get. Uh, it's probably not available in most sporting shops in Japan. So, how do you go about issuing equipment to like clubs and 
Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, junior equipment, we've been really lucky. We've had a chap called Cheyenne Batia over in Dubai who's supported us ever since the earthquake in 2011. His program, Cricket for Care, has sent us a ton of plastic equipment. Um, the funding from the ICC goes, goes a lot of it get, does get spent on that. Um, and the um, sort of adult equipment, that's harder. Most of it does get, get brought in from overseas, gets ordered in. There's one of a former Japan national team member uh, has set up his own equipment company called OT Cricket. Um, we helped him get um, get authorized by the ICC to be a uh, you know worn recognized brand. Um, yeah. He's not making his own equipment. He's just buying it, putting his stickers on it, and and that, that's that's all right. Um, but um, yeah, there's no no one manufacturing cricket. We are we are in talks with a major Japanese sporting brand who might be interested in going the whole hog. I mean, they were talking about planting willow trees and stuff. So, but it, you know, when the Japanese get into something, they really do it properly, but, yeah. and they're willing, they're willing, they know that if they're planting willow trees, they're going to wait 30 years before yeah. they can start making their own bats. And they understand that and they'll, they'll work towards that. Um, so I think that, that that's one of the next steps to try and do. I mean, there's a lot of Japanese companies heavily involved in cricket, you know, ASIC sponsoring the Australian national teams for years, Japanese companies. Yeah. Um, you know, there's Japanese companies um, sponsoring the IPL and IPL teams, and Nissan are one of the ICC's global sponsors. So, mm. you know, it's a logical next step, but at the moment it is a bit of a struggle. We do have to order. Most of our hardball equipment does come from overseas. Yeah, so it's the same when I was chatting to Matt Featherston from Brazil, um, Cricket Allen, and he talked about that they've hired their own bat manufacturer who's making cricket bats in Brazil. Mm. Um, and they've, they've got sponsorship deals as well with Newbury in England, yeah. sending them some kit, uh, kit. So I suppose associate nations just have to try and resource the best they can with the resources they have. Um, but it's just the, the way it goes in the associate sort of system, really, lack of funds and, and money in that. Um, what international grounds do you have in Japan where the team plays their cricket? Tell us about so the Sano International Cricket Ground where I am. Um, we have two ovals here. One is uh, men's in, men's ODI size, and the other is women's ODI size. Yeah. And then the um, Kaiser Cricket Field down in Osaka that is women's ODI size, I believe. Yeah. Um, we could probably get approval to play men's T20s there as well. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, those are the three international grounds, and there's a host of other grounds which are a mix of um, the the, the Kaiser Kaiser Field is still only um, a synthetic mat pitch um yeah. but we do have um proper squares on the two grounds here at the SICG so yeah there, there's a host of other grounds around but they're all um matted um wickets and there's some which just use a rollout flex pitch as well yeah um do they have lights floodlights or anything or no lights not quite we, there are some lights here which illuminate the nets so you can at least have a net in the evenings um and the there's a ground down in um, Kawasaki that we use, which has lights, but it's a, you know, it's a rectangle. It's a, it's a rugby pitch, really, that we use for cricket. So, some of the some of the women's league matches get played down there, but um, and they have played a few games under lights, but we haven't got. Um, I mean, that kind of thing. You know, the cost of that is just astronomical. So it's not on the radar just yet. <laughs> no, and then obviously you have to get them up to a certain standard, probably ICC exactly. or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah, the more pitches we can have, the better. Um, yeah. But lights and, and such, you know, it would be great because it gets dark early in Japan, which is a bit of a headache. But <laughs> yeah, uh, um, but yeah, we need some need some proper government support or sponsor funding for that. I think. Yeah, yeah that's another thing. The grounds, obviously, ground staff, turf pitches, quite Nightmare. limited in Japan. Yeah, um, we're very lucky. We have a, a consultant called uh, Todd Luckhurst, who's based in Melbourne. He's been coming over here for a really long time. He's become really engaged in Japan cricket. Probably Japan cricket's number one supporter outside of um, Japan. He's uh, yeah, comes up. He's honeymooning over here next year. Actually, combining that with his um, his uh, visit to come and work on the ground with us. So he's been helping us with our turf pitches for yeah a really long time, and very lucky to have that. And through our partnership with the Titans in South Africa, they sent out the head groundsman of Supersport Park, he was South Africa's groundsman of the year um, last year, and he came out in, in June to help us with reseeding the square. So you know. The, the knowledge base in Japan is is low. Um, we, we, we didn't even have a full-time groundsman at the start of the year. So 
We're actually just employing someone. We've gone through basically the whole year without a full-time groundsman. So, yeah, that, that's a struggle. But, you know, hopefully we can find someone to fill that gap and to really um, get into it. And we used to have a guy for a few years, a chap called Yoshi, um, but he moved on at the end of last year. So, yeah, like making turf pitches and managing a square, it's, it's a science. You know, these guys... Yeah they are highly qualified and highly skilled and we don't have that and also the conditions here are unique um yeah what 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 characteristics are make a classic japanese pitch we don't we don't really know yet and we're still trying yeah. to work that out yeah um so when we have had games so we played a japan uh, sorry a sri lankan emerging team came over in may last year and they're a really good side um and they were struggling to make 120 on our pitches so you know we we want pitches that are Good for batting on because T20 cricket is all about scoring runs, and yeah. so managing that is, is important, and it's something that we are trying to put a lot of focus on. And, and yeah, we're getting a bit of support from the ICC as well on it. So we're lucky to have some good good relationships, but you know, it's still early stages. I mean, we've only had the square for five years, and um, you know, it take, takes a while for it to settle, and we've got to work out how best to maintain it. But there's some good people around doing that. So fingers crossed, we can find a rhythm with it. Absolutely. Um, another question I had, being an umpire myself, um, Alan, obviously I like to ask how the umpiring is going in different countries around the world. Uh, in terms of development of umpires, do you have any umpires that are accredited with the ICC or do you have a good umpiring program in place in, in Japan? Yeah, something that I've put quite a lot of focus on in the last few years, i umpiring a bit myself. Um, I yeah. mentioned the, the game up on Mount Everest, I actually umpired that one. Um, so during COVID, I kind of did did quite a bit of this um strategizing we're very lucky we've got a chat called chris thurgate chris has umpired in a lot of icc tournaments um and he you know been in japan 20 plus years his his boys play cricket um and his son marcus actually captain in the 19 team at the world cup chris speaks speaks good japanese um and he does most of our umpire education i'm sending him another guy called adam burst who again another aussie who's been over here 20 plus years um, speaks great Japanese. They're going out to an ICC umpire education, a tutor education program in New Zealand in January. Um, so those guys, the ICC are, are bringing out, there's a an umpire foundation course, which you can do all through an app. Um, and then there's a level one, which you can do most mostly through the app, but involves some practical um, yeah. assessment. So in the last couple of, so we're going to be getting people through that. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've also um, created the umpire panel, which has sort of 25 to 30 people. And we're trying to put more, you know, we're rewarding them, actually paying them, giving them clothing, and then trying to um, encourage them to do more and more games. So the more games they do, the more they get paid for all of the games. So, you know, you do five games, you're getting 5,000 yen a game. But once you hit that fifth game, you'll get 7,500 yen for all those games. Yeah. So, you know, just trying to get some kind of scale to rewards people who are doing it. The issue is you, you might have 25, 30 people, but you tend to rely on the same sort of 10, 15. Yeah. And there's a lot of cricket throughout the year. So um, you know, every weekend and every holiday from the start of April to pretty much the end of November now, there's cricket on. So it's a lot of umpires and it's a vital part of it. And there's not enough Japanese umpires. So that's something that we're trying to work on as well, because yeah. ultimately you want people to feel comfortable out in the middle. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the laws of cricket, they're constantly changing. Having them in Japanese, it, it, that's a challenge. It's a big yeah. old document. So all, all, all obstacles, but they're not insurmountable. And most umpires would probably be, realistically, they're probably be speaking English anyway. If they're going to take their yeah. umpiring further. So, yeah. But a lot of the umpiring, it's about confidence. And a lot of our players, you know, they don't necessarily have that confidence, particularly if they're umpiring, you know, guys from the subcontinent who are incredibly passionate, incredibly loud. They get yeah. a bit taken aback. Um so um yeah that, that's that's a challenge um we had to bring in a disciplinary committee to deal with on-field issues to try and make umpires feel more comfortable yeah. out in the middle yeah. um, and that's been quite effective i think and that came in around the same time as the panel so those were my two big projects during covid which are still running they could probably run a bit better but but it's, it's, it's a start yeah that's that's good to hear i guess it's the same with scorers i suppose doing courses for that because scoring can often be difficult as well yeah it's a real headache actually it's that's an area where the japanese do excel um we have had quite a lot of <clears throat> a lot of people come through yeah who are good at scoring and it takes it quite quickly and the mums are actually quite good <laughs> um, 
Excuse me. So, yeah, that's something a lot of scoring is done on apps now. So it's live yeah. scoring done through the stream. So we need to make sure and it's very hard to learn on the app. You can't. Yeah. You have to just learn by doing it. And that's yeah. not the Japanese way. They like to be very practiced beforehand. Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example. When you learn how to drive in Japan, you do a little, you drive around a little driving course and you pass your test in the driving course. You don't even go out yeah. on the road. So the yeah. theory is you're perfect when you go out on the road. It's like in England, yeah. first time you start getting a car, you're out on the road. Um, yeah. They just do things differently over here. People like to be in in their own mind entirely competent before they even begin. So scoring yeah. on paper um, is people can get up to quite quickly, but transferring that to the app and all these apps are a little bit fiddly. But they, you know, the apps are quite intuitive. Once once the game is started and set up, it's it's quite easy, and it's actually a lot less work. But um, but yeah, scoring scoring is one of, it's actually the next thing on my radar really because the sound of the scoring does sometimes horrify me that I see in club cricket. <laughs> but we've, got, we've got a handful of guys. I've probably got about four or five guys who I can really rely on who are excellent. Um, yeah, and um, that's something I'm looking to build out over the next couple of years. Yeah, well, it's as I said, it's, it's definitely a, a difficult task to, to master. Sort of like umpiring, really. Uh, you got to stick at it and learn. Um, last question before we move on um about coaching in terms of people going through the ranks of coaching yeah. courses and that how's how's that in japan it's a similar thing the umpiring um education course from the icc is very it's actually modeled on one they've already done for coaching and rolled out so yeah. again there's a, a foundation course that you can do all on the app there's a level one that's 80 percent on the app and then um a practical assessment and we sent two of our guys rayo sakurano who i mentioned and the chuck called vinay Aya. They went out for a level two course recently. Um, they flew out to uh, Vanuatu to do that whilst the women's tournament was on. So they're ICC level two coaches now. Um, and we have a couple of guys who are coach assessors. Um, so our men's national team coach, Dougal Benningfield, and our women's assistant coach, Bebe Miyagi, they're both able to assess coach and, and give them their level one. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna build that out really. It was, it was something we've been waiting for forever. Um, the ICC were promising it for a really long time. And now it's done, it means that there's um, actually a, a proper coaching program that is in place and that is um, established and consistent across the world um, rather than, you know, the ECB goes up to level three, but so Cricket Australia only goes up to level, so the ECB goes to level four, Cricket Australia only goes up to level three. So what, what's the difference between a level three coach in Australia and a level three coach in England? Like, it's very difficult when you're hiring staff from overseas, as, as we still do. Cricket South Africa only goes up to level three as well. I think. Or maybe, no, they got to level four too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to understand what everyone does, it, it makes it very difficult when you're hiring. So we're still hiring to hire our top coaches, our national coaches from overseas, but we would love to be in a position where we don't have to do that. But that's probably going to be, again, quite a long time down the line. Yeah, and especially the language barrier as well. People who don't speak Japanese is... Yeah, it, 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 it's helpful. My dougal has been here a long time, so his Japanese is pretty good. But mm. um, but you, know, you are always relying. There's, you, there's always somebody in the playing group who can translate. Um, yeah. yeah. But yes, it would be great if the message could be delivered in its native tongue. Yeah. But the, the reality of where he is, I mean, that, this is the case all over the world, you know. Um, coaching messages generally they're delivered in English. It's I'm not saying it's right, but it tends to be the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good to hear your thoughts on that, <clears throat> Alan, about the growth and development of, of cricket in Japan. Um, and I thought to end our uh, interview today, which I've enjoyed immensely, Alan. I've learned so much about Japan cricket from listening to you. Thanks, Jack. You speak so passionately about cricket in Japan. You care so much, which is fantastic to, to hear. We need people like you promoting associate cricket more and more. So I thought to end this interview today, Alan, we, we talk about what the future holds for cricket in Japan. I know it's very hard to pre predict the future at times, very uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen in a few years. But, Alan, how do you see the how do you see Japan cricket and associate cricket going into the, into the future and the years to come? Yeah, well, we, we work off five-year strategies. Um, we're just finishing the... Um, second year of the current strategy which is called kaika so kaika is like um the blossoming of the flower it's just as the the cherry blossom it opens up so that's kind of where we see ourselves now um since i've been here the first strategy was a shining sport of choice and that was just trying to make 
people aware that cricket exists and, and there's something that they can choose. Um, the second strategy was, um, uh, what was it called? It was building a brighter future. Yep. So, and that the way, what they said in the Japanese was a, a future beyond imagination, something that you couldn't think could be achieved. We're building towards that. And that was that under 19 World Cup qualification. Again, it was not something that anyone was talking about when we built that strategy. And then we ended up achieving that. Yep. So we're, we're building those steps, you know, now we've over the last sort of 10, 15 years, this, this structure has been laid down and now we want to, we want to blossom. And this one will be the beginning of that. And beyond that, it will be hopefully, you know, cricket, cricket across the, the country. Um, we, we want cricket to be a professional sport in Japan. And we want players to be able to make a living from the game. Now that might just start off with one or two players getting contracts from franchise leagues. And we know that's not easy, but you know, it's possible if you can find players with the right talent and the right mindset and determination to really have a go at, at making a career in the sport. So that's, that, that's sort of what we've built into this current strategy is, is having a professional player. You can read the strategy on our, on the JCA website, cricket.or.jp. It's there. Um, and then beyond that, look, the associates, it's very difficult to know what the ICC are going to do. They're, they're pretty unpredictable, but by joining the ACC pathways, we hope that there's just more opportunities to play. You know, our players and our teams need to be more visible. I don't, on, honestly, to be blunt, I'm really, really sick of people saying to me, you know, oh, does Japan have a cricket team? I wouldn't think Japan played cricket. Yeah. Um, I just, that's been my goal since I got here is to end that. And people, yeah. people still say to me now, when I say that I work at the Japan Cricket Association, people still say, is that your full time job? Um, which yeah. is, which I find both like offensive and just quite, quite sort of face palmy, really. Um, yeah. But I get it. Like people don't know how much cricket is exists here, and um, that's on us to try and change it. And hopefully, we've done a bit of that through our social media platforms. You know, I've mentioned um, uh, the website, but you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We've got you know, I think it's like sixty thousand followers, subscribers across those platforms. We've got a newsletter that goes out. And I wrote it yesterday, actually. It goes out to you know another sort of twenty, thirty thousand people. So. You know, awareness of Japan as a cricket playing nation, that will only happen by playing in more tournaments like Asia Cups, World Cups. You know, we've got to perform on the field and we'll get that recognition. It's something that's got to be earned. And I understand that. Um, and so we want to try and try and earn that. Um, as far as in Japan, like, I, like I've said a number of times, we just want to be in the dictionary, we want to be in the vocabulary, we want people to know that cricket is an option. And, and we are making progress there. Um, the more crickets in the media, the more the national teams perform, the more media coverage they get. I mean, it's difficult. You know, when we qualified for the Under-19 World Cup in 2019, the first question we got asked by a local reporter was, so what are the chances of Japan winning the World Cup? And it's like, well, you know, we're picking from a pool of 50 um, yeah. and India are picking from a pool of 50 million. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the scales aren't quite weighted the same. Um, but look, that's that, that's all... Sport is meritocratic. It's it's the ultimate meritocracy. So we have to try and, and do what we can with what we have. And and there are talented players out there and we have to harness that. And hopefully the sport becomes more visible. We're, we're getting more more and more partners. Um, you know, we've, we've got a great partnership with the MKI who've been supporting our women's team since 2019. Um, more partners and more sponsors coming on board will only help the game develop. So I mentioned before that there's a whole lot of Japanese companies involved in cricket. Hopefully they can start getting involved in Japan cricket. Um, and yeah, we can take the game to to a place that 10 years ago people wouldn't have even considered. And, and you know, the more people that we're employing, the more players that we have seeking to, you know, achieve their goals and live out their dreams as cricketers, then that's great, isn't it? So we're, our, our, our JC, the JCJ mission is to spread spread joy and build bridges between communities. So ultimately that's what we're trying to do. But at the same time, of course, we want cricket to be mainstream. And that's not going to be something that happens quickly. Um, you know, I've been here 10 years and we're, we're, we're light years ahead of where we were 10 years ago. So who knows where we'll be in another 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more with what you said there. And um, just trying to break down that stigma and barrier, isn't it? Mm, um, which is the so. frustrating thing, but hopefully we can start to do that um not only with japan cricket but associate cricket in general really and i suppose that's the the perception that most people have towards associate cricket and that's why the reason i did the the series on the podcast is to promote it 
And absolutely, you know, we're grateful for it. Jared. Sorry, <laughs> we're grateful for it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, nah, because I suppose I have a connection to an associate country. Obviously, my mother is from Thailand originally, and you know they've done some good work over there in Thailand cricket. Yeah, so, the women's team is outstanding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I have some sort of connection with associate cricket, um, and that's why I wanted to do the series to promote the other side of cricket. You know, you all know the well-established teams like Australia, India, uh, England. But, you know, who wants, you know, you want to know more about Brazil. You want to know about Japan, Mexico. Who I well, every time, every time you watch a football World Cup, a rugby World Cup or the Olympics, you mm. always find yourself, you always have a second team, right? You always yeah. find yourself coming behind athletes from other nations and mm. the colour and the personality that they bring. Well, cricket just seems to lock itself off from that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you look at the colour that Japan had brought to the Rugby World Cup over the last couple of cycles, and look at what the African nations bring to the Football World Cup every time. Um, you know, why wouldn't we want that in cricket? Um, it, it will just make the sport more fun, more enjoyable, more diverse. Um, and there's no reason why those countries. We've just seen Uganda qualify for the yeah. World Cup. I mean, how awesome is that? Um, yeah. You know, I can't wait to see what, what their their supporters bring. It's going to be great. So. You know, the more of that, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And it's it's one of those things that cricket, you know, tends to lend itself, you know, thinking about just one Pacific group of countries and not thinking about, uh, you know, cricket's a global game. So you think about the whole world as well, uh, which we need to improve on in, in international cricket and think about others rather than self, which has been the case for the last well, a few years. Um, Absolutely. And that, that needs to change the, the perception, the the attitudes towards associate cricket, because, you know, there's a lot of good countries that are doing some great work in promoting and developing cricket in, in those countries and making life better for the people who play the game or involved in the game. I'm sure that's the same in Japan. Alec. Yeah, very much so. It can be really powerful. Sport's such a powerful tool. Mm. You know, I try not to get too cheesy and start quoting Nelson Mandela, but it does have the power to change people's lives. And um, and we see that being in the EAP, we see that in the Pacific region a lot, yeah. um, particularly empowering women in, some, in the Pacific Islands. Like some of the stories there are, are amazing. And I should probably point you in the direction of Tim Cutler. He's someone you should probably get on your podcast. He's been over in Vanuatu and he's worked at Hong Kong as well. And he's seen that firsthand. Yeah, a lot of people have suggested um, his, um, <clears throat> his contact and you should speak to him, which we'll definitely get in touch with Tim, doing some good work um, over there um, as well, uh, which is which is fantastic. And, um, you know, we need more passionate people like yourself, uh, Alan. I spoke to Matt Featherston from Brazil Cricket. He's very passionate in what he's done there. So if you put the time and the effort and the resource into associate cricket, you can see what they can achieve. Look at, you know, what um, Afghanistan did. They were an associate nation. Now they're well, a full exactly. Yeah. You look at those journeys of Afghanistan and Thailand and it should be an inspiration mm. to the others. So th there's so much on offer there, but we just need to, to put the time and the effort in there. And that's the most frustrating part, um, the way that cricket is governed and the way it's uh, operating. Well, Alan, thank you so much uh, for speaking to me today. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed our chat on all things Japan cricket. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure everyone listening have enjoyed it as well. Alan, if people want to get in touch with you, if, if people live in Japan, they want to get into cricket and all that stuff, where can they find you and where can they find out uh, Japan cricket? Uh, the best places is through those social media channels I mentioned. So the Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter or X. Um, sending messages through there um, is, is the best way to go. Or through our website, you can contact us through cricket.or.jp. Um, but if you just search Japan Cricket, there's there's plenty of um, plenty of places on there that uh, you can reach out and, and send us messages. Um, likewise, for, for myself, I, I am on social media a bit, but you're probably better off coming through the association rather than going through my personal channels because I, I don't chat them as much as I used to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose life gets busy and you, you're focusing on a other important masses, of course. Well, um, yeah, trying, trying to get off the phone so much and trying to actually yeah. remember there's a world out there. Yeah, well, there is. Uh, there's a world in social media, obviously, which is not a real world, but 
anyway, it's it's one of those places of communication. So we'll leave links to those in the description for everyone to check out and support the good work Alan's doing with Japan Cricket and check it out because they're doing some great stuff over there. Now, before we go, remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Once again, thank you, Alan, for joining me to discuss and talk all things Japan cricket. And I hope all of you watching or listening to this Associate Cricket Series episode learned a lot about cricket in Japan from Alan. Until next time, keep safe and bye for now.